So it would be, but, but, but we, we, don't, we don't yet know any, well, we, don't, we don't really know precisely what the holographic duals of these theories are. So there is, there is some suspicion that maybe such theories are actually not consistent. And that, that even, the first, even before you do this anti-brain uplift, uh, you, you may not be doing a consistent physics. But. So the criterion of consistency here is that they should have a proper holographic description? Is that the point? Yes, yes, that's, that, that's, that's it. Okay. What if I say, hmm. Yeah, every, I mean, if, if, you, if you believe, oh, I, I, think you, I think we should all believe that, that well, let's say, when you have a quantum gravity in ADS, then you get a consistent quantum theory on the boundary. So, if you, so in this, by ruling out some, some classes of CFTs, you can rule out some classes of quantum gravity theories in ADS. But not swan plant altogether, right, I suppose? Um, maybe maybe not, but mm. you, usually the swan plant criteria are, are for flat space, and as we discussed at lunch, there is some interesting tension mm. between flat space and ADS, but yeah, you could, you could certainly hope to, mm. to rule out some big classes of ADS vacuum, proposed vacuum strings here by, by bootstrap logic on the boundary. What, what, what it tells you about flat space, uh, I don't want to go into. <laughs> okay? Any other questions, by the way? Uh, yeah, so I, I, well, not, not only that CFTs are connected to a lot of interesting physics, but unlike general quantum field theories, they can be defined and studied completely abstractly, starting from a set of axioms, which, which are obeyed by the operator algebra. So the, here are the axioms. They, they fit on one slide, and they tell you they are basically exhaustive axioms for what? The operator algebra of a CFT should behave like. First of all, the, the conformal group is uh, in the three-dimensional Minkowski space is SO2 comma D. And then the set of local operators of the theory is a unitary representation of this group. It's unitary because of a state operator map. The set of local operators also happens to be the Hilbert space on the D minus one dimensional sphere. And that's and the, the conformal group acts on this Hilbert space, so it's, it's, it's a unitary representation of this group. Now we describe the theory in terms of its primary operators, which are labeled calligraphic OI. They are, these operators are labeled by the scaling dimension delta and uh, rho, where the, so the, the, the delta, delta is, char, is the charge under, under an SO2 factor, so that this SO2 comma D has inside of it the, the SO2. SOD. SOD is basically the group of rotations in, a, in the Euclidean space, in the Euclidean space, and the, the SO2 is the scaling. I mean, it's, it's slightly subtle. I, I put these the tildas on because really we are studying the universal cover of this group, but I don't want to go into the details. So I'll just add a little bit algebra. Delta is the charge on the SO2, and rho is the some irreducible representation of this SOD. It's so the always or almost always when you talk about conformal field theory, it's I mean, the, the question is with respect to which group is it unitary? Right? It is it's always unitary with respect to the Minkowski group. Right? So so the, this is the Minkowski Minkowski and uh, conformal group. The theory is unitary. Uh, all the generators are unitary in the, in the Lorentzian signature, and that. That mean, and that unitary representations of this of the Minkowskian group are labeled by these labels. So even though it's a bit it's a bit tricky because SOD is the rotation of the Euclidean space, but it is it is the label of the Minkowskian unitary representations. So in particular, these are not unitary representations of the Euclidean conformal group. That those are very different. But in actual computation, often you will go to a Euclidean signature. Yeah, it's, so it's much more simplify your calculations. That's, that's, that's right, yeah. So the, the, the theory, yeah. The, the, the simplest objects are Euclidean correlation functions. You can only continue them to go to Lorentzian signature, but the notion of unitarity is defined in Lorentzian signature. So, if, so, so for example, the, the 3D Ising model is a Lorentzian unitary CFT. It's not a Euclidean uh, unitary CFT. Uh, okay, and crucially, the operators form an associated algebra known as the operator product expansion. And this is comp compatible with the conformal symmetry. That means we can take a product of, uh, of two local operators and expand them in, a, in an infinite series of the other operators. And there, I suppress some position labels, but roughly speaking, the position labels are completely fixed by, 
by the conformal symmetry. Okay. And th that's it. Those are all the axioms for the local operators. They turn out to be highly constraining. And the conformal bootstrap is the effort to constrain, classify, and solve quantum field theories starting from these axioms. And perhaps eventually answer some of the questions from the first slide. The program was started by uh, these gentlemen in the, in the 70s. Ferrara, Gatabrillo, and also Polakov and Mack. Uh, any, any questions about the axioms? No, uh, one can say that there are basically two approaches to, to harvesting, exploiting the information in, the, in these corporal bootstrap axioms, namely the analytic and the numerical one. By the way, if you started with the decimal group, it would be non-starter. You couldn't get anywhere. Right? The decimal group is the same as the Euclidean corporal group? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it means it's a great question. It doesn't, yeah. I, I don't know how I, how I would. Okay, if I want to do the city physics, uh, then there is no yeah, boundary it's certain, CFT you can insert this for it. I mean, there are people who do, who do the SCFT, but I don't, I don't really understand it well enough to, to comment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in the, uh, on the analytic side, there is a growing number of, of nice analytic bootstrap results, but they typically, or always, require some small parameters, some vertebrate parameter. For example, large, there is some conformal bootstrap at large spin, and you can also have, uh, whenever you have a small coupling, you can try to solve the bootstrap equations perturbatively in this coupling. And this, this has been done in, in many examples. On the, on the other hand, the most dramatic success of the conformal bootstrap is the existence of bounds on the low lying spectrum. And this is, which are nearly saturated by some interacting CFDs. And this, this approach is so far almost entirely numerical. So this is an example of a, an exclusion plot. Uh, for three-dimensional CFTs with a D2 symmetry, where the blue region is, is allowed by the bootstrap equations and the white is not allowed by the bootstrap equations. And you, you see there is a small, very small island uh, inside of which the, uh, the known values of some scaling dimensions for the 3 d isn't CFT uh, are lying. So the, this, this really seems to indicate that if you impose the conformal bootstrap axioms, eventually, you may, you may really just get isolated points as solutions, and these isolated points precisely correspond to the physical CFTs. What is the x-axis and y-axis? The, the, yeah, this, the x-axis is the, the dimension of the sigma field, so the D1 which couples to the magnetic field, and on the y-axis is the dimension of, of the energy operator, D1 which couples to temperature. Mm -hmm. Maybe you already said this, but how densely do we, do we know anything about how densely these allow regions are populated? Um, no, 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 I mean, we know, we know, many, we know some examples of Is there one on the tip there? Uh, I, I, think the, I think the fact that you have this tip is maybe just, uh, just the result of uh, having a finite precision. If you go to infinite precision, maybe this region will disappear altogether. I'm not, yeah, I'm not really sure. We, you know, the, the, the point is that also the, the parameter space is infinite dimension. Here we just have projection to, to two parameters, but if I, if I include it, if I include all the possible scaling dimensions of primary operators, it's probably just the isolated points which may be quite far apart. But, either, but, but yeah, it's, it's a valid question. Just projecting down to these two, just to these two dimensions, how, how does it populate it? I don't know. I mean, even a single CFT can give you multiple points in this plot because this plot is the reverse to the OP of sigma and sigma. So you could take other two Z2 equal operators and look at their OP and look at the first operator there, and that will give you another point. Uh, another point in the same point. So I honestly I don't I don't know where they are. Um, so our the, or our goal or one big goal in the community is to try to bridge the, bridge this gap, bridge the gap between the numerical and the analytic bootstrap, and empirical eventually find an analytic explanation for the precise location of the bootstrap bounds and islands. So we, we know that some strongly interacting CFTs lie at these edges of bounds or inside islands. So if we really understand how exactly it is that the equations are giving those bounds, we will learn, we will, we will, we will learn perhaps how, we, how to solve the CFDs, how, how, how one can use the bootstrap equations to, to really get the spectrum of the CFDs. Let's draw a couple of pictures. OK, 
Okay, and, that's, and uh, what I'm going to explain in the rest of the talk is some steps in this direction, even though I'm, I'm not going to find an analytic formula for delta sigma and delta epsilon in the, the 3D model, although I would, I would really like to. It's, it's a bit too ambitious. Okay, so any questions about the big picture? So just a uh, quick review of the crossing equation or the bootstrap equation. We'll just look at a four-point function of four scalar primary operators in our theory. The operator is called phi, and the uh, conditions are x1 up to x4. Here I'm using some short notation for x, i, j is the difference of the positions, and uh, you can write a four-point function in this form. So there is some prefactor which takes care of the transfer, which makes the object conformally covariant with the appropriate weight. And then there is some, in principle, unknown function of two variables. These variables are known as cross ratios, C and D bar. And the cross ratios are can be obtained from the positions using these formulas. Yeah. From this point on, if you can forget about positions and everything is just a function of the, of the cross, function of the cross ratios. So, notice that, well, basically, Z or Z bar, or Z and Z bar are becoming small when Either operator two approaches operator one, or operator three approaches operator four, and z and z bar become one in the opposite limits when one approaches four or two approaches three. So when the is I'm going to comment on whether z or z bar are independent or not uh, in, a, in a second. So now that the bootstrap equation is, is just a statement that if we expand this four-point function in OPE, we can do it in two different channels, and we, we must get the same result. So here uh, on the left is the say the S channel expansion where we fuse operators one and operator two, and on the, on the right hand side is where we fuse operator one and operator four. We just are not very important, and in, uh, in equations we get we get this kind of we get this kind of equation. So we are summing over all the operators which can appear in the in the phi phi in the OB of phi and phi. So the operators are a bit low; they appear in phi phi OBE. There is a c squared because we get one c from each of these vertices. And then there is a function known as the conformal block. The conformal block uh, is, is completely fixed by conformal symmetry. It's, it's not a dynamical, a dynamical parameter in the, in the theory. It's, it's the same in all, the conformal blocks are the same for all CFDs. And in this case, the conformal block only depends on the scaling dimension and spin of, of the calligraphic cost. So the left-hand side is the S-channel expansion, and to get the D-channel expansion, you just replace Z with one minus Z, Z bar with one minus Z bar. Then you say all CFTs, I mean all CFTs with the same primary operator content. Yeah, well, it's just you, different C. Yeah, you, you, can different. Define, you can define a class of functions known as the conform blocks. They are where delta and J can be arbitrary. And if you if you have a CFD where the where the delta and j appears, you just take that control block from the class of function. So you, it's a it, yeah. it's, it's like it, it, the, the, the normal blocks can be found once and for all, and then you, you plug them in your in your favorite CFD for the specific values of delta and j that you need. Okay, let me let me stop, now say a bit about what is the region of the z and z bar where the equation is supposed to hold. So here's the equation again. And the basic idea is that, well, what, what is this equation trying to tell us? So what, what are some basic of its properties? Well, for, for each value of z and z bar, we get some constraint on this data of the c, so delta phi, delta o, and, and basically all the, all the delta o's and c phi phi o for the operators which can appear in the phi phi o b. So we have an infinite, amount of infinite number of constraints or infinitely many unknowns. You can actually show quite easily from this equation that the sum must always be infinite. Roughly speaking, uh, there is some singularity for small z and z bar in the in the other channel, which can only be reproduced by this by this sum if, it, if there are infinitely many terms in the sum. So it's quite easy to show that this must be an infinite sum. So yeah, you, the equation is, a, is an infinite number of constraints. For, for every value of z and z bar, we get a constraint on infinitely many unknowns. So it's a bit hard to analyze. People have made some progress. Um, about, you, about values of z and z bar, well, there is either, either you can be either in the Euclidean signature or in the Lorentzian signature. In the Euclidean signature, 
z uh, is the complex conjugate of z bar. So let me just uh, draw a picture. So by, uh, we have four points. By conformal transformation, you can bring them to 0, 1, infinity. Three, three points, x1, x3, and x4, you can bring to the First of all, you can always bring the four points into a plane, two-dimensional plane, and then you can bring the points to 0, 1, and infinity, three of them, and then the, the fourth one, x2, is going to be at, uh, at some value of z. This is the comp now this is the complex z plane, and this is the complex conjugate of z bar in the Euclidean signature. Now in the, in the Lorentzian signature, you still, you still take this to be space, but you still take this to be time. And then, let me just draw the first picture again. So this is zero, one, and infinity. But now this is time. And z and z bar are, are the light cone coordinates. So there is a, there is a light cone of zero, and there is a light cone of one. And the operator two lives in this, in this diamond. So z is basically d minus x, and z bar is d plus x. And, and these two situations are just related by the rotation. OK, so can you comment very briefly on what kind of questions uh, Euclidean signature is indispensable, and what other questions Lorentzian signature is useful? Because often, it's, I have the impression that people use the Euclidean signature almost 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, is there any problem where Lorentzian signature is needed? Well, somehow it looks like recently this, this analytic bootstrap rule is mostly, is mostly using the, the limit, the, 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 the Lorentzian kinematics. For, for example, recently there was an important discovery by Simon Carl Wood of an inversion formula, which mm -hmm. I think Peter Crutcher is going to talk about at length in two weeks here. And uh, the, the formula takes, uh, it important depends on the values of the correlator in the so-called regio limit. Mm -hmm. so from, in, in CFDs, there is the notion of a regio limit, which, which is an inherent Lorentzian, Lorentzian limit. I'll, I'll say a bit more about it. But, but somehow the point is that there is only there is really only one four-point function, and everything else is is a, I mean, everything is an only a continuation of the same function. You, you can start with the with the I guess these are called Schwinger functions. But, but basically the the correlator in the Euclidean signature and uh, the time-ordered correlation functions in Lorentzian signature are just analytic continuations of that. So there is there is only one object, one analytic function, where everything, you can always go to the Euclidean signature where things are singular only at coincident points, and that, that's, that's it, so. Right, that, yeah. uh, did you say that four points can always be brought into one plane? Yes, do you, do you disagree? Or? Uh, I think three, for three points it's uh, obvious, but well, okay, let's see. Well, you, you put one at infinity, you can do that just by some inversion with respect to the point. Then you translate another one to the origin. So then you can, I guess you can rotate. Yeah, you can, you can rotate one to, the, to be on the x-axis and then, so basically you can, you can arrange the three points to zero, one, and infinity, and then you, can, you still have rotations around the, around the real axis, right? So by the rotation around the real axis, you can always bring the fourth point to any plane you want. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so so yeah, this somehow touches upon what I was saying before, that the, the, action, the equation actually holds for z and z bar complex and independent. But these are really just two different real slices of the same function, so the same analytic function of two complex coordinates. And in this way, Euclidean and Lorentzian signature are just related by some analytic continuation. Um, this is again the region of z and z bar. Yeah, I, sh I should say I should explain these branch cuts. Basically, the yeah the you have the S and D channel OPE and the S channel OPE only converges where when z and z bar are away from from this right branch cut. 
and the B channel OP converges when Z and Z bar are away from the left branch. So really the, the real regime of validity of the equation is that it's for Z and Z bar complex and away from the from these wide strips, from, from the from the branch cuts. Now there are some interesting limits that one can take in this uh, in these in this region. The first kind of simple OP limits where Z and Z bar approach either the origin one or infinity. I mean, the OP limits are, are, are kind of Euclidean limits. So I have I infinity minus infinity because E and Z bar should be complex conjugates of each other. And there, there are the double light cone limits, which is where the most most uh, interesting or most powerful analytic bootstrap so far has been derived, which is where when Z and Z bar approach 0 and 1, I mean, let me show it in this picture. The OP limits are where this, this point goes either here, here, or here in the Euclidean signature, so 0, 1, and infinity. But in, in Lorentzian kinematic, kinematics, there are some other interesting points. For example, you can take the point 2 to, to this double light cone. So there is a, here we are, appro we are becoming now separated both from 0 and from 1. And that's precisely the first, that's precisely the first point. But when z, so this is z bar maybe, and this is z. So z is becoming 0, and z bar is becoming 1. So z is 0 here, and z bar here, with this, with this point. And finally, there is also the regime limit, which I, will, I won't have much time to discuss, but it's when z and z bar are both going to infinity, but on the same, both on the upper half plane. But okay, the, the, where could we on this side? Uh, the, the point of these limits is that that's where the analytic bootstrap operates. By expanding the equations around some of these points, you can you can get constraints on the on some analytic constraints on operators which dominate the respective limits. But if you if you really want to if you want to understand these non perturbative bounds, they are presumably a result of some non-trivial non combination of all these about all these constraints. So we need some approach which is capable of extracting data from the whole crossing region. So somehow it, the idea is that for example, for the double light cone limit, the operators which dominate in the OPE are operators of large spin in one channel. And in the, in the regular limit, it will be the leading regular trajectory which dominates. In the OPE limit, it's operators of, of a small scale dimension. But in a, a non-parabolic CFD, all the operators talk to each other. So we, we, need, we need to find some approach which, which can harvest the information from more, more globally from the, cross, from the whole cross. Well, one way to make this formal, and which also one way which also connects to the numerical bootstrap, is to talk about functionals. So you can uh, you can think of the crossing equation as a as an equation which lives in a vector space of functions of z and z bar, and we can parameterize the bootstrap constraints by elements of the dual space of this space. And these these dual these dual vectors I will call functionals. And for every such functional, we can apply it. The crossing equation and find 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 just an equation between numbers. Right before it was a vector equation in a vector space of function of z and z bar, and by applying omega, you get an equation between between numbers. So yeah. is, it, is, it, is it clear what happened here? So I, I basically I started with the maybe it's obvious, but um, so we started with this equation where we have a sum over conformal blocks. And the same thing with uh, z and 1 minus z exchanged, z bar, 1 minus z bar exchanged. Now you put everything to the same side. By that, you get this, this function, where which is the difference of the S channel block and the T channel block. And then, uh, the full crossing equation looks like this. This is really nothing deep, this is just a way of rewriting it. Now all the operators contribute additively, so you can think of these you can think of these functions f as vectors, vectors in some form in some infinite dimensional vector space of functions of z and z bar. They all add up to zero, which means that for every functional, we can we can take an omega apply to this equation and get zero. And provided omega is sufficiently nice, you can commute it with the infinite sum. This has been understood what these conditions are for omega. 
And when you combine it with the infinite sum, you get, you get this equation. Now, the simplest example of the function is just evaluate at a fixed point at z and z bar. Right? And in the numerical bootstrap, numerical bootstrap is really just a search for functionals with some required positive properties by expanding the derivatives around, around z and z equals z bar equal 1. So, um, you get this. Yeah, we get this this crossing region, which has some interesting limits. And um, I told you that the analytic the analytic bootstrap expands maybe around here and here, around the double height cone, so that would be z equal zero and z bar equal to one. What the what the numerical bootstrap does is that you expand around the around the around the center. So you expand, angular expand. around z equal z bar equal to one half. So you write your, your functional omega as a linear combination of, uh, of this form. And in practice, in the numerical program, this sum is finite. But in principle, you can can explore the, the whole space here by, by going to an infinite order into the derivatives. And that's that's why the bounds are only becoming optimal in the in the limit of large number of derivatives. Right? Somehow, if I if I if I go to a very high order in this expansion, the expansion starts probing the the the, the this, this boundary the branch one. So that's somehow by going to large order in the in the numerical bootstrap expansion, I can. I can start sensing what's happening in, this, in these analytic bootstrap limits. Is the dual vector space really defined properly uniquely, or is there some arbitrariness sneaking in here? Uh, the discussion. Or, is that, is how unique is the definition of the dual vector space? Well, it is the infinite dimensional space here. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's it's known. I mean, it's known what what are the necessary and sufficient constraints on omega. So it's, it's, it's known what omega, what kind of, yeah, it is known what the set of allowed omegas is for this operation to be allowed. It, it, it must once it's allowed, are my results then, how can I say this, using a given omega, uh -huh. can I get uh, reliable results of the original question of what are the Yeah, so the critical dimensions? This, this, equation is always, this equation is always true, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what you need to find is what are the allowed omegas for which you can, you can commute the, the sum, mm -hmm. the omega. Such, such that uh, this, you, you, want, you want to find what is the set of omega such that this equation holds for all solutions of the crossing. And, it, and uh, these constraints have been, have been understood. So, but after that, you want to find so as good as possible omega inside. Exactly, exactly. That's, that's the problem. And that's, that's precisely, that brings me to the title of the slide. But those the, the best possible omegas are called extreme functions. So the optimal bounds arise from optimal or extreme functions. This was first discussed by Shiro Shok and Miguel Paul. I think the question was well, how, how many of those are there, the optimal or extreme? Are they sort of unique or? Right, for, for, for each. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the functional, which which uh, is responsible for the bound at a given point, is generically unique up to up to an overall scale. There, there are some there are some determinate situations where it's not true, but probably speaking, there is a, there is some kind of duality between the so we to crossing and the functional. If you, the, on the yeah, on the on the boundary of the L region, the solution is typically unique, and the extreme function is also typically unique. But there is no complete theory of these functions. That's 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 what I'm working on. Somebody else may not come next week and uh, improving the bound, for example. <coughs> Once you find a bound, that's it. That is the D bound. Uh, it's not like subject to improvement by next time finding a better omega or something. The, the bound is optimal if and only if there is a there's an actual solution to crossing which saturates it, which saturates it. If there is a solution to crossing that saturates it, you can never improve it because because mm -hmm. the new bound would sure. violate the solution to crossing. 
And that's are you going to saturate the bar? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But I'm only going to saturate it for some for some simple case like the, the generalized free theory. But if it, that's that's already um, okay. Let, let me let me keep okay. going now. So this this is a slightly subtle point, but basically these, these constraints on the extreme functional imply that the extreme functional should have double zeros on the on the vectors which appear in the optimal in the optimal solution. Is this was this uh, ever explained to you? Maybe I should I should review the argument a little bit. But then you won't have time to finish the report. I think it's I'm doing all right. I don't know if anything can happen, of course. <laughs> so, yeah, I should just uh, at this point. Hmm. Okay, so I raise the question. Right, so the typical bootstrap, the typical numerical or optimization bootstrap problem is that you want to maximize the cap in, in some OBE. So in this case, in the pi pi OBE. So for that, we want to construct functionals which have the property that when, act, when omega acts on, on this delta, and let me now suppress the spin, spin parameter just for clarity. So let's just imagine we are like in 1B where there is no spin and everything is a scalar. So we want this to be non-negative for, for delta greater than some delta star. Okay. Now if, if such an omega exists, that means that there must always be, in every consistent solution of the crossing, there must, there must always be some operator with dimension less than delta star. Right? That, that follows from here. Basically, if, if all these these guys are always positive by unitarity. So these guys these guys can't always be positive. There must be at least one term in the sum where omega acting on f is negative. So if we can find we can find an omega which is positive from or non-negative from some point on, so let's say positive from some point, which is which is positive from some point on, there must be at least one operator, one, one element of the sum which is in the negative region of the omega. So here's just an example. Let's yeah, so often I'm going to use a shorthand where omega of delta is just the result of the action of omega on the on the F. These are this is the definition. Okay. Instead of talking about omega as a, as a dual vector, I'm just going to talk about the function omega which omega of delta which you get by acting on the on the F. So this is a typical example of an extreme functional. If you can find such a functional, it means that there must be at least one operator in the red region for, for in every solution to cross it. Because if, well, if all operators were in the green, green, green region, unless they are exactly at the zeros, then you would get a contradiction with this equation. You would have a sum of positive terms equal zero. So there must be at least one operator here. Okay, uh, and now what, what happens is, is we, we try to improve the bound. Well, improving the bound in this case means trying to push delta star lower and lower and lower until we can't push it down anymore. And the reason why, why, why we can't find omega with delta star less than something is because there is actually a solution to crossing with, with the delta, where delta star is the gap, right? So the functionals and solutions to crossing are so sort of dual to each other. The functionals ban solutions to crossing, but solutions to crossing ban functionals. And in, in that case, this is, this is precisely what happens, right? That delta star, this would be, um, so we now, for the optimal case, we know that there is a solution to crossing where delta star is the is equal to the minimal delta O. So here delta star is the omega of delta is positive from this point on. This is this is delta star, minimal delta O. But there are also other operators. There are also other operators in the OPE. So the the only way that omega can be non-negative from this point on, such that this equation is satisfied, is if actually all the terms in the, in the sum identically vanish. And so that means that the fact that the, the omega of delta must have, must have zeros at the locations of all the other operators in the spectrum above the minimal one. And these, these are typical numbers as well. 
But by no negativity, they must be some even order zeros. And typically they are even, they're, typically they are second order zeros. Well, if, if, you, if this was a bit too quick, then just, just remember that the structure of double zeros is important. And the every extremely functional is the structure of double zeros, which, which sit exactly at the locations of the operators in the spectrum. So for the 3D using model, there is, there is some functional sitting here, the optimal one, which is, which is a first, which is a simple zero at delta epsilon. And then it has double zeros precisely at the locations of all the higher Z2 even operators in the previous inspector. So in particular, if you can find the optimal functional, you could read off the scaling dimensions in the previous just from the locations of the, the double zeros. Sorry, what did I call it? 3 3 3 oh, sorry, 3 then you say if you can find, does that mean if you can cook up one or if you solve for some equation that gives it to you? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's... Looks like I, it's I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think, I don't think that uh, anybody will actually find the, the function of the force, somebody say finds the, the actual four-point function. It's, also, it's, it's, not even, it's not even clear if 3D is not really saturates it. Saturates is, is even the optimal bound that has not been proven, and there are some reasons to believe that it might not saturate it. But the, the, the difference is, is very small. I mean, the, the difference between the actual optimal bound and the 3D easing model, if there is some, would have to do with uh, with presence of higher, like higher trace operators in this MP. But that's, that's a bit of a technical point. Somehow, the, in interacting CFTs, the OB is very rich. And in free theories, you basically just get two particle states, but in interacting CFTs of two dimensions, there are also higher particle states in the OP, like composites of more than two phi's. Mm -hmm. In a free theory, the OP would only contain phi squared and, and some derivatives of this, but in interacting theories, there, there must also be operators like phi to the four, phi to the six, and they all talk to each other. But the OP coefficients are very small. So maybe it's possible that, well, it's possible that we using model is exactly on the bound, uh, but if it's not, the, the difference between the previous model and the bound is controlled by the size of these OB coefficients. Right? So, uh, extremely functional, the coefficients that appear are the derivatives. Is there any order to them, or are they just like other? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. Now. Okay, so finally, I'm, I'm getting to the results part of the talk. Uh, the results are they, con they concern some specialization of this Crossan equation to to Z and Z bar. So Z and Z bar are both still both complex, but, uh, but tied to each other in this way. And we expand the both sides in the, in the 1D conformal box. So this, is, this is exactly what you would get if you just had a 1D solution to crossing. So you're just using one dimensional conformal symmetry. So all the bounds that you derive in this case are also applied to the higher dimensional case, but they are, they, they are not optimal for the higher dimensional case. But they are, they are still valid. So the, the main result is the con construction of two bases for the dual space, where the elements of the the elements of the bases cons consist of extreme functions. So the, each of the basically it's like a change of bases from the derivatives, uh, which I erased, to, to some some other kind of bases of functionals where the elements already are extreme functions, but they are extreme functions not for some interacting theory, but for the for the general for the generalized free theory. Right? There are two different bases which we constructed. One of them is tied to the general speed fermion. The general speed fermion um, the general speed fermion has scaling dimensions delta phi, two delta phi plus two n plus one in this where n is zero, one, etc. And the general speed boson has dimension two delta phi plus even integers. And they are, they are holographic duals of, uh, of either the massive fermion or the massive scalar in ADS. But that's uh, then the, the function, well, just to show, to show you that uh, they are good for something, or the, in an academic interest, you can use them to compute within diagrams in ADS2, including uh, loop diagrams, and in some cases, in principle, to any loop order. And then I, a point which I probably will, will not have time to discuss, but it's interesting is that the deposonic basis is actually equivalent to the 1D version of the so-called polyakov style bootstrap using this diagram. You can talk about it later if you're interested. 
Now, uh, what are these functionals? What do they look like? This, uh, this class was first discussed in my paper in 2016. So instead of expanding in derivatives, now we are going to write them as some contour integrals in the complex e -way. The The functional in this class, omega, uh, so omega is a functional, f is some test function that we apply the functional to, and h, uh, h is just some integral kernel which defines the function. So instead of coefficients of derivatives, we have some analytic function h of z. Now the, the function has, the, the prescription has two parts, and don't ask me how I, how I thought about it, but I, I just tried many different things, and in the end it, it worked. But one nice property of it is that, well, it has, it has two, there are two contour integrals, one from one half to one, and the other one from one, one half to one half plus i infinity. But one nice thing about it is that it sort of connects all the different interesting limits. The, the one half is, is where the numerical bootstrap starts, this is the OB limit, and all up there at infinity is the regular limit. So somehow this function probes probes the interesting limits in some intricate way, which I, I don't even know how it works. But. What's going on with B bar? Uh, yeah, so I said Z equal to B bar. So they're, they're identified. It's like, it's like a 1D situation. So if you, if you write you write a function this way, by the way, from now on, just to ease up on the notation, instead of delta phi, I will, I will write A. A is based delta phi. Okay, now for, for the whole thing to work, there are some there are some constraints on what h must be, some functional equations, but you can ignore that they are just technical details. And then the interesting thing is that under these assumptions, when you apply such a functional to the to the f vector f of delta, you you get something like this. And what's most, most important is the prefactor. So the prefactor is something that automatically produces for you the structure of double zeros. So the Know that h, h is just that h doesn't depend on delta. So the whole delta dependent here is coming from applying it to the f of delta. But this, this function, it's like one plus or minus cos of this guy, has double zeros precisely when delta is 2a plus even or odd integers. So when, when the sign is, is negative, when the sign is the upper one, which corresponds to the bosons, this guy has double zeros at these locations. And when it's the lower sign, it has double zeros at these locations. But what is the h of z function is speaking? Because yeah, uh, uh, it's coming. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's coming. Yeah. And this is a kind of a fu uh, functional, I mean, it's an integral transform here, right? Yeah. Okay. What do we call it? It's the dual functional. This is not into a number, right? Is it? Or is it? Yeah. I think it's another basis. Well, well, you can I thought it gives so a the, dual the basis. Function, the functional is, is different. The single functional is specified by choice of h, and the basis is uh, well, the, 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 there is a there is a basis of, of h's. There is a set of choices of h's which which are compatible with these equations, and they give you the basis of functionals. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's that's here. So there, there are two different bases. One is fermionic. So in the fermionic case, the previous expression simplifies to this one. And there is a set of solutions. H h was constrained by some by some functional equations, and you can try to solve for h. And if you find that there is a there's an infinite set of solutions. Which well, you basically look, look like this. So um, well, they are they are uniquely labeled by by these equations. So that, that's why we are getting a basis. Basically, there are two different kinds of solutions. One is going to give us omega functions omega n, and the other one is, uh, gives us omega hat n. Uh, well, without going into details, basically, because there could be some singularity in this integral, the singularity could make one of these double zeros into a simple zero or cancel it completely. So for example, so the omega functionals, they vanish on the whole spectrum. So they have simple zeros on the spectrum. And they have double zeros everywhere except for one point. So somehow for, the, the basis is dual to the vectors in the generalized speed fermion. For every vector in the generalized speed fermion, you have two functionals. One which is, has a double zero everywhere except for that point and has a simple zero there. And the other one has a double zero everywhere except for that point And at that point, it's, it, it's not vanishing. It's essentially for every yeah, for every vector for every generalized free field vector, you get two two functionals, one which is dual to to the value and the and the other one which is dual to the derivative. That's that's not really that important. And you can you can show that these functional form a basis for the dual space. So instead of using 
derivatives in a numerical bootstrap, you can just use the basis of these of these H's, which I'm not showing here explicitly because they're quite complicated, but in some cases you can find them in closed form. So for example, when the external dimension is one half, here's a closed formula for the for the H basis. These guys are just Lagrange polynomials. And you can find a closed formula for the action of the, so this would be the first one, the omega D1, the function which is dual to the to the first vector. So in this case, when delta when the external dimension is one half, the first operator is that one plus zero plus one, so it's a two. So this functional has a double zero on the whole spectrum except for the leading operator, which in this case is a two, and there it's a simple zero. Uh, in particular, this uh, this function proves that the that the free fermion maximizes the gap among all unitary one D solutions to cross it. But if, if you were if you were to repeat the numerical bootstrap in one D instead of in three D, you would find just a straight line. You would find that as a function of delta phi, there is an upper bound, and the upper bound is two delta phi plus one, and it's allowed. To and this this function <coughs> omega zero given by this guy. Is precisely the, the unique extremal functional which is responsible for this optimal bound. And then, as, as you go to higher d, the bound becomes stricter and stricter unless, until at some point it becomes the 3D easing bound. As you increase dimension, it's always, right, but this, this is just the simple at the equal one case where actually the free theory is such a bound. So, are there like no anomalous languages, no deformations for the free bound? Uh, yeah, sure, that's, that's right on the next slide. So oh yeah, just thing I'll say is that the dream is to find some analytic formulas for the functions of interacting C and D. For that, we would have to go to higher D and work much harder. So yeah, the formations, that's what you asked about. Mm -hmm. just so how much of this, it sounds like you want the entire analog of all the analytics, but how much of this information are you using, like the actual analytical form of it? Do you, how do you need all of it? So, so the, there is a there is a unique functional. This this function is uniquely fixed by the requirement that it's obtained by acting with a function on f of delta, and by the requirement that there are double zeros everywhere except for here. But then there is a unique there is a unique how to actually fix it. So does it does this answer that? Well, I mean, it's a uh, question about scale. But <laughs> it's not right. um, but how much do you actually need the analytical form of this curve? You, you don't, uh, in order to prove that uh, that there is a bound, you don't need the architecture. Right? You, you just need you just need to know where it's positive. So you, you don't need the precise form. But but to do some other things, like for example, study with the diagrams, you need the actual form. Uh, so that's that's what I talked about here a bit. Let's let's imagine that we uh, we deform the, the double trace operators in the in the free fermion. So we, we deform them to to the leading order. Right? So for everybody parameter G, these are the scaling dimensions, these are the from OP coefficients, crossing symmetry maps to this equation. Now if we if we apply, uh, we, we, can, we can use the, these basal functions to immediately rule out such deformations. Basically, if we apply omega m to this equation, you find that the only outermost dimensions must vanish because the omega m only has a simple zero at one point, so it, it picks up only the outermost dimension of the m guy. Uh, similar for the omega hat, it only picks up the, the OP coefficient. So from, from this, you can prove that the free fermion has no, well, it, it has no deformation unless we introduce new states in the OP. And this 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 has sort of nicely, this is a nice uh, AES2 analog because the free fermion is just dual to, to Majorana fermion. And you could you could imagine writing down deformations, but there is actually no no relevant deformation in the AES2 because because psi to the four vanishes because of fermion statistics. And once you add, once you add derivatives, it becomes irrelevant. So you, there, there is no way you can define a unique complete theory just by writing down a Lagrangian for a Majorana fermion in two. Now this is this is different for the bosonic case. So I'm just going to run through it because I want to get some yeah, get the more interesting parts of it. Uh, so in this case, there is some subtlety that basically you have one less functional, so you can never construct a functional. Yeah. So every function vanishing on the whole spectrum has at least two simple zeros. So you, you can never find a functional which has just one simple zero and double zeros everywhere else on the whole spectrum. So that means that now there will be a deformation which is allowed. Um, we, we play the same game, we write down some, some deformation, and now 
Um, now, because because of this fact that you don't have any, there is no function which would only pick up one anomalous dimension, but every function is going to give you one relation between two anomalous dimensions. There is actually one parameter family of solutions, and this one parameter family of solutions you can precisely map, you can you can check that it's, it's equal to having a phi to the four interaction in ADS. So phi to the four didn't exist as we know, but phi to the four is perfectly fine uh, deformation of the massive free scalar in ADS two. You can compute the all the anomalous dimensions either using written diagrams or using the functionals, and you get a you get a perfect match. This this was the, this was also done in more than one D using a different technique by. Uh, so talking about uh, any contact interactions with derivatives. Okay, so the, the contact interactions with derivatives uh, are not not going to be relevant because you have at least. So there is no interaction with the derivatives in 2D, but there is one with four derivatives, and that's, that's why they're irrelevant. And that, that, doesn't, that doesn't give you a UB, UB complete boundary theory. I mean, you, you, would have, you would have to redo renormalization, you would have to add higher and higher vertices, but, but for, I mean, the simple reason is that the, four point, the boundary four point function, I mean, you, you can just compute a within diagram, right? So say I give you a five to the four with four derivatives, you can compute a within diagram. And the boundary four point function is not bounded in the region. So that, that's, the, that's the important ingredient which I didn't have time to talk about. But these functions are, are only, they already incorporate the boundedness in the region. So to, for, a, for, a, for a finite coupling well defined CFD, everything is always region bounded. So the consequence of unitarity and crossing. But when you expand things in perturbation theory, the perturbative terms may not be bounded. So that's why I mean, maybe we can discuss later. But you can, you can. The answer is you can also derive these common interactions from the functions. But you need to take some linear, some further linear combinations of the functions, which can also see four-point functions that are not bounded in the region. But you, you can do it sort of order by order in derivatives. But uh, now I want to just say a few words about how to go to higher orders in the coupling. So that would that would correspond to loops on the ADS side and. You can still do it. So you can, if you if you have fixed all the all the CFD data of these operators to a certain order, you can apply either omega n or omega hat, and to find okay, these guys should be swapped. You can apply omega n to find the animal's dimension in the next order, and apply omega hat and to, to find the OP coefficient in the next order in perturbation theory. And uh, well, we did it at one loop. So order G is, is the tree level in ADS, and order G squared is the one loop in ADS, where uh, you have the bubble diagram, the five bubble diagrams contribute, and uh, it, it matches between the functional computation and the ADS computation, and actually you can also go to the two loops. So here's a, here's a result for, for the two loops. And that, that, that's, where, that's where the, first, the fact that you were asking about the precise functional form, there are some trigamma functions, etc., etc. That's the reason why, why you're getting zeta 3 and zeta 5, etc. So, okay, well, I don't think I really have time to discuss with an exchange diagrams, but you can also do it. Here, there is an extra source term in the equations because there is an extra single trace operator propagated in, in the diagram. So what, basically what you find is that the corrections to anomalous dimensions and OP coefficients in the written exchange diagrams are precisely the, just the values of the function. If you, if you want to find, I, I don't think I should go into the, the, the answer, but, but there is a very fundamental connection between the OP expansion of, of written exchange diagrams and the actual, this, this function omega of delta. Right, so I have omega n of delta and the, the statement is that Omega n of delta is precisely the is precisely the OP coefficient of a of a, of a double trace operator, of the n double trace operator in the with an exchange diagram. So that's, that's, al that's an alternative way how to compute these operators. But yeah, I, maybe I can tell you later. And because of this connection between functionals and with an exchange diagrams, you can prove the so-called Polyakov bootstrap. The Polyakov bootstrap equations. If you know what they are, great. If you don't, I'm sorry uh, for now. But uh, they are just, uh, there is the statement that the double trace is canceled. So here we, we can show that 
the coefficients of double trace are functionals, so then the reason that they cancel is just is just that this equation is flat. Once you sum over all the operators in the spectrum, you, 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 get, you get a zero. Fine. So that's I just said it in words. Let's, uh, let's finish. So the, the, the results are that uh, we found two complete phases for the one we for bootstrap equation, which consists of extremely functionals. The bosonic phase is equivalent to the polyco bootstrap, so the polynomial term takes to the correct value. And obviously we'll discuss this later, but that's why we don't find them. And the basis can be used to see how some platform block in a cross channel influences the directional CT data, computed with the diagrams in ADS2. So our results are definitely reminiscent of the OP inversion formula of similar current laws. It's basically really looks looks almost the same, but we haven't understood the connections. It would be interesting to clarify the connection and finally extend the framework to, to high high read and boundary scaling. Thank you. can be expanded in some derivatives, and then you can, in some cases, you can find the coefficients analytically, but uh, you don't really learn very much. You can, still, you can still do it. You can take one of these omega i functionals, write them as a contour integral, and then you can go to the derivative basis just by, by sort of doing it. You have to apply it to some function, you expand the function in the Taylor series, and evaluate it term by term. So the, the coefficients of derivatives are basically moments of, these, of this function h. Can be done, but uh, yeah. Yeah, just one. Would you please go back to the slide where you had the omega functional for the boson? Yeah. This one. Is this, uh, so since you mentioned the uh, relation between uh, single-gram mode, is it because of the science square? That's, that's basically, yeah, that's basically the reason, so. I think. That comes from the double Exactly, yeah. so it's, it definitely looks like that the functions are just computing double discontinuity, but somehow by staying on the first sheet, so this is just, with the double discontinuity, you usually need to go to, to the second sheet to compute it, but uh, yeah. maybe you should talk, talk later not to, not to bore the, the bootstrappers and the audience too much. Uh, that, that's precisely the idea. Let's go back to the part where you showed that there are no definitions. Okay. Of the, of the fermion. So yes. Yeah. Here. All right. So is there anything you can say about like, how far away the next CFT is if you have an isolated CFT? Maybe, uh, so it's sort of related to the question earlier about you know, how densely populated are these regions. Is there some sort of minimum radius that says blocks that you can extract? Mm. Uh, that, yeah, yeah. Well, well, you would have to first decide what is the right metric. I mean, I guess you can just use the difference of scaling dimensions. I mean, I'm going to I'm going to answer by by a different answer. I'm not going to answer a question, but maybe it's interesting. So, one thing that I didn't put on the slides uh, is that you can actually take some linear combinations of these omegas, which show you that there must be a, in every solution of the crossing there must be at least one operator in every each of these bits. These operators are separated from it by two. And you can show that for every solution to crossing, at least for delta phi equal to one, that's, that's when we did it, there must always be at least one operator in each of these bits. So that's a kind of structured theorem for, for CFDs. My, I don't really answer your question, but it's related to uh, So is the trend that you replace essentially the problem of finding uh, anomalous dimensions with the problem of finding the solution of uh, optimal functional for but then, uh, why is it easier? Um, it's not. It's not easier. Uh, but uh, I think the, the extra thing that these functions have is that they they, they give you these general bounds that you can study their positivity, and uh, you know that there must for every function there must be always one one operator in, in the negative region of the function. So, for example, that's how you can show what I just told earlier. There must be at least one operator. In the 
right? So, yeah, I, I'm not claiming that this is the right way to to come to do perturbation around here. It's, it's just one way to do it. Probably using Simon's formula is the easier way. But there's, there's the extra added benefit of, of, of giving you bounds. I mean, it's an, it's an explanation of how the analytic bootstrap, which, which gives you correction, which gives you anomalous dimensions, and perturbation theory, is connected to the numerical bootstrap in principle, which gives you upper bounds of this kind of dimension. So you mentioned you cannot go over some kind of perturbation theory, like the previous slides, because of kind of how it's functioned. The same you can do using the standard analytic Yeah, there's the additional disclaimer that people don't know. Oh, Simos formula doesn't work in CFT 1 ADS2, so at the moment I think this is the only way to do it, but, but there's probably some extension of, of Simos formula to CFT 1 ADS2, which would be the simplest way. Yeah. I, I think people are able to do it. This, this is just a repackaging of the same thing which clarifies the connection to the the we should ask more questions after the talk. Thank you, Steve.